Hello? Oh my goodness. I'll, I'll try to speak quietly. Still a few people coming in. We're going to begin. Okay, so welcome everybody to our um, first panel this morning, uh, which is on nomenic solidarity. Can memory be a form of solidarity and resistance? My name's Keith Lowe. I am the author of Savage Continent and uh, most recently a book about monuments uh, to the Second World War called Prisoners of History. My own research focuses mainly on World War II and the memory of World War II and its aftermath. But our panel this morning has a much broader uh, interests um, which encompass the whole of the 20th century. At the very end, uh, we have Jesus Alonso Carballes. Uh, Jesus has a PhD in contemporary history from the University of Salamanca. He is currently Professor of Civilization and the History of Contemporary Spain at Bordeaux Montaigne University in France. His latest research has focused on the representation of the memory of victims of war and violence in urban space. So he approaches this subject through the study of monuments, through places of memory, through museums and commemorations and so on. So absolutely perfect for this panel this morning. Then just to my left here, we have Jujana Burgray, who is a soci sociologist and associate professor at Pasmani Peter uh, Catholic University in Budapest. Her main teaching areas are post-1945 Hungarian social history, identity theories in the modern and postmodern eras, uh, the sociology of religion, and religious communities in a secular world. Her current interest is the survival strategy of the monastic orders that were dissolved by the Hungarian state in, in 1950. These monastic orders, she believes, can teach us a better, sort of healthier way of remembering uh, the traumas of the past. Then uh, next to her, we have Elżbieta Siszewska martinska I hope I pronounced that right. Ish. Uh, who is a historian of ideas and a sociologist. She's assistant professor at the University of Warsaw's Institute of Applied Social Sciences. Her research areas include all kinds of things from European and American uh, intellectual history to I, uh, the ideas and the legacy of uh, East Central European dissident movements, um, especially in the 1970s and 80s. Her best known publication is a book called The Public Philosophy of Solidarity. That's Solidarity with a capital S, Solidarność. So she will be bringing us uh, solidarity with both a large S and a small s. And finally, we have uh, Claudia Florentina Dobre, who is a senior researcher at the Nikolai Yorga Institute of History at Bucharest. Her focus is on the memory of communism, museums, memorials, and monuments, deportations, and academic cultures in, in the the whole of the Black Sea region in the 20th century. She's published various things, um, including this lovely book she's just given me, which is uh, The Quest for a Suitable Past, uh, available in English. Um, and in fact, she's literally just published a book uh, two weeks ago called Former Political Det Detainees and the Securitate. So if, if you are a Romanian speaker, rush out and go and buy that now. So that's our panel. Um, each of them is going to give us a brief presentation of sort of five to seven or eight minutes maximum, and I'll, I'll be policing that. <laughs> uh, then we're going to debate a little bit amongst ourselves, and then finally we will open up the floor to you for questions. So uh, we should probably begin. Uh, let's start with um, Jesus Alonso Carvajes who will be speaking to us in Spanish, so. Uh, 
Eh, bien, ahora sí. Bueno, en primer lugar, y aunque tengamos poco tiempo, quería agradecer eh, a los organizadores, eh, tanto de Polonia como de, de Barcelona, la, la organización de este coloquio tan, tan interesante y tan apasionante. Hello, is it working now? Oh, my apologies, my apologies. Ahora ya sí, ya sí, ya está, ya está. So, I was telling you before that when I was invited to the conference, I thought about uh, discussing about the memory of the Franco dictatorship because for many decades, as we all know, the only public memory here in Spain was on the winner's side. Luis de Castro speaks about hemiplegic memory here in Spain. In the last few years, the Republican memory had been silenced, that had been postponed, annihilated, annihilated, has reappeared into the public space. But we oftentimes forget that during the Franco dictatorship, some groups, especially women's groups, preserved the memory as a form of resistance against the Franco dictatorship. These pictures were extracted from Daniel Palacio's PhD project. Here we can see images about, well, taken by relatives of the Franco dictatorship victims. I would like to focus on this case, in the case of La Barranca, which is a mass grave near Logroño in the area of La Rioja, where around 400 people were murdered and buried. So for decades, the relatives of all these murdered people the widows and the daughters mainly celebrated different forms of commemoration in a very difficult environment, in a very difficult social context, because the police would ban such celebrations. And we are speaking about a very macho and patriarchal society, so the struggle of women is even more important in such environments. So for many decade, decades, as I said before, they would bring flowers to the mass grave. They would mark also the limits of the mass grave. And again, this is one of the most iconic examples of what I'm referring to. Yeah, one of the most iconic examples or representations of this banned memory, of this forbidden memory, which was saved thanks to the perseverance of this group of women. Back in the 70s, this area became a memorial space thanks to the previous task before these lands were given away by the owner, and, well, uh, there were many efforts to turn this into a civil cemetery. In the 70s, a monument was built at the entry of this mass grave. As you can see, this is a history column. It's quite an interesting example with a representation of bodies, like if the bodies or corpse had been extracted from the mass grave. And regarding the topic we raised yesterday, the slogan at the center of the column is quite interesting. This error 
is from the past. We don't want revenge, but we want a testimony so that this craziness does not happen again. So there is a forward-looking approach here, not a revenge willingness, but rather an articulation of a memory space projected towards the future. This is my interpretation at least. Here we have a few more images about or from the column with a representation of women, which is quite surprising and rare back then. So in the last few years, in order to pay tribute to the struggle of these women, of these widows who contributed thanks to their solidarity and their forms of resistance, well, they contributed to preserving this mass grave. So back in 2011, a monument by Oscar Zenzano was built where these widows are represented in a very sober manner, in a very humble manner, one would say. And what I believe is remarkable is the dignity and the serenity with which they operated at all times. This monument was built or inaugurated on November the 1st, 2011, as we know, the Day of the Deaf. A few years after, in 2018, the, monu the monument was vandalized with fascist inscription on April the 14th, 2016, and 2018. In both cases, well, many of these widows passed away already, but the monument has become a form of resistance because, as Pascal already says, the only way to prove a monument works is when, they, when monuments are vandalized and attacked. Back at the end of 2021, this site was declared site of cultural interest by the government of La Rioja. So this is a way to ensure the preservation of, these, of the monument. And again, this is a way to ensure the preservation of memory in the space. Thank you. Thank you to be here. It is my pleasure to share with you one of my ideas about religious persecution. In the short, brief notes, I would focus on the three points. First of all, I highlight what is the meaning of the cultural memory according to asthma. Second one, how can we listen to each other if the modern society, late modernity, postmodern society, we can more and more remembrance communities. It is quite difficult for us, as I realize. And the third one, what is the duty and responsibilities as memory researchers in this new situation? I take this question focusing on the religious persecution which is, which is means cultural resistance, and I would introduce a new term, religious resilience, which is, means for me flexible resistance. So let's begin. Um, memory, as we know well, creates a community of memories, provides, secures home in the world, ensures the continuity and coherence of the community, the desire to belong. So altogether, memory thus becomes a place of solidarity. Continue this argumentation. According to Esman, communicative memory is not enough for the society, for human beings. 
we need cultural memory. But there is an ideal type of cultural memory. And I would add, cultural memory in the postmodern era is a quite interesting phenomenon because it doesn't necessarily have to be authentic because it's a kind of myth, legend, I would say half truth, full of emotional emotions. So memory likes one perspective and it doesn't tolerate ambiguity. Obviously, and we can feel always we only want to identify with exemplary, the patriotic, a good ancestors. We don't like controversial historical heroes. Let me give you an example that I had to understand for this. Why are researching, uh, why are researching women history in 1956? I met a lady who was a freedom fighter. She had served 13 years in prison. She said she was a nurse. She fought next to his soldier husband. Her child died during the revolution and her husband was executed. And after that, she was sentenced to 13 years. Everything what she was about, what she was talking about was the trauma, of course. But after the interviews, I just felt some unsettling feeling, confusing, because it was as if the interviewers had spoken about a kind of myth. She spoke from too much of one perspective where she was a hero and became victim. No contradiction, no confusing, but you know, when we are talking about our life history, we always quite fragmented, quite confusing, full of complexity, and no, here, no. I have to go archival research, and that revealed none of what he said to me, she said to me, was true. Actually, she was a prostitute. She had no husband, no child. She grew up in a state care. Why, she till, why did she lie, we should ask. In the end, I finally understood to be honored as a hero because she was a hero against Soviet army for Hungarian citizens. She was really a hero. She had to get rid of her real past because she would, have to, she would not have to fit the myth of 56. This lady knew well, very, very much what I am talking about here. The national past as a common heritage serves a present-oriented purpose. It preserves, uh, empowers, and mobilizes. But there is a problem today with a uh, common past, contemporary society, the postmodern society. Today, many different communities of remembrance are emerging and growing. This is also breaking down the canon of unified national past. A nation can break into different communities of remembrance. There is an official version of of the past, but that there are also many, many other versions. So the last point for me, let me give you another example focusing religious persec persecution. It happened in Hungary, 1950. The religious orders were divided in hum Hungary. Formerly highly respected religious women and religious men became panelists and destitute. But my question in, and their question is, how can they remember remembered if there are many, many communities of memory remembrance? Uh, so, uh, who, will, who will listen to them? It, why is this question, this, uh, question for me? Because I would stress again, each community remembers according to its own values, own ideology. Who will listen to the past of a monastic community today outside its own community remembrance? Who cares today about the humiliated situation of monks in a 
secularized world. The more important question for me as memory researchers, how to tell their story? Why important for us, not for me, for us? This is because under dictatorship and authoritarian regimes, monks developed different strategies of survival and maintain their identity. I really think we could learn a lot from there if we would be able to listen to them. I call their strategies religious resilience. I wouldn't say they were hero. I wouldn't say they were resilience. Resilience, memory, using different, many, many different perspectives. Their stories are not monolithic. Therefore, there is a chance to they will be noticed by different memory communities, hopefully. They are listened to. To do so, they need to break out of their own narrow communities in some way. Last sentence, Reli uh, religious resilience, this is a concept that has a place in a collective memory, that builds collective identity, that we should hope heals a wounded identity. That's all. Okay, thank you, Szezono. Our next speaker is uh, Elżbieta Cyszewska martinska Thank you. It is my pleasure to be here. <coughs> uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm a historian of ideas and sociologies, and I'm going to uh, speak about the Polish Solidarity Movement um, um, from the perspective of these two disciplines, uh, two fields of study. Um, unlike my uh, predecessors, I'm going to focus on um, macro history or meta history. Um, uh, there are beautiful, uh, very interesting uh, personal stories connected with, with the Polish Solidarity Movement. Um, but as a historian of ideas, I am more interested in the intellectual happenings uh, that translate into social and political happenings. And uh, I'm also interested as a sociologist in some patterns of behavior, especially those who are uh, repeated um, unconsciously, sometimes without thinking. People um, tend to behave in certain ways um, without thinking why and why they are doing what they were doing. Uh, so uh, I would like to focus on the idea of solidarity and how it was explained explain, um, uh, um, by uh, uh, Father Josef Tischner, the unofficial chaplain of the, uh, of the movement. It is the collection of his sermons, essays, um, on the ethics of solidarity, on the spirit of solidarity. And um, I would like to focus on, in the second part, I would like to focus on um, different understandings of the movement and different interpretation of the movement with the special focus of, um, I would say, the Republican, um, the Republican interpretation of the, poly, of the Polish Solidarity Movement. Uh, so let's start with Josef Tischner. And um, yesterday we already heard some things about um, what solidarity meant for, for Eastern European dissidents. But um, let me quote um, a short passage uh, from his sermon delivered uh, at Wawel Hill. It is the hill uh, it is the castle in Krakow where um, Polish kings, romantic poets are buried. So it is a very important place for the, uh, for, for the Polish culture. And, and um, uh, he said there that, let me quote, today we are living through unusual times. People are discarding their masks. They are 
emerging from the hiding places and showing their true faces. Uh, from under the dust and out of the oblivion, their consciences are emerging. Today we are as we truly are. Believers are believers, doubters are doubters, and non-believers, non-believers. There is no point in assuming someone else's role. Everyone wants to be called by his or her name. What we are living through is not only a social or economic event, but one that above all touches us personally. The problem impinges upon human dignity, human dignity that is based on the conscience of human beings. The deepest solidarity is the solidarity of consciences. And it shows this deep ethical dimension of um, police solidarity movement and also in general um, uh, Eastern European dissidents movement. Um, solidarity understood in such way, in such a way, did not need an enemy or opponent to strengthen itself and grow. It turned towards all and not against anyone. And um, I think it is really important that they gather at Wawel Hill. Um, because to understand who they were, they needed history, they needed memory. Um, the history um, was teaching them who they, teaching them about their true identity, I would say. And as you can, um, as you could hear, it was quite in class, inclusive notion. Yes. And um, the second thing I would like to say is how solidarity has been um, described in Statuna Sandi and Post Factum. And it was described as a true workers' uh, revolution, another Polish national uprising, a carnival with sentence because the solidarity uh, was stopped in December 1981 by introducing martial law. Um, it was described as a revival of a civil society or a civil society of a new type and even as a community of first Christians. And uh, all of those interpretations are, I would say, are quite uh, legitimate. <laughs> um, um, there is something to them, I would say. Why? Because uh, solidarity people um, said that they were inspired by um, some workers, democratic tradition, Catholic social science, uh, national uh, traditions. But I think there is one interpretation that I found uh, that I find uh, particularly interesting, uh, because already in the fall of 1981, um, a British historian, Timothy Garton Ash, um, uh, compared uh, Solidaris, Solidarity's first national convention in Gdańsk to a parliamentary assembly from the Nobles democracy, democracy era. It is, um, <laughs> actually he said that the Poles were continuing uh, the traditions that were um, initiated that started in the 16th century. Um, and he added that in his opinion, the Commonwealth of Poland left a rich, a rich legacy of ideas and memories. At the Congress, he witnessed how aristocratic political culture of two centuries before reemerges like some underground river in the workers' school of political culture. The analogy between solidarity and the first Commonwealth of Poland was premised, above all else, on the practices of the movement and its, and its unspoken public philosophy. And um, let me tell you something more about the uh, similarities between um, uh, Polish solidarity movement and the uh, republicanism of the, fellow, of the Polish nobility, which dates from 1500 to um, 1800, more or less. Um, Polish republicanism, uh, 
was not anti-monarchism. It was um, it was an, an idea to limit king's power, but to establish uh, not and not to get rid of the um, of the monarchy, but rather to establish constitutional monarchy. And uh, nobility was gaining more and more power at the expense of um, uh, of royal prerogatives. And what is what was very characteristic of the Polish republicanism, it was the style of debating. The Polish nobility would gather to, to debate, to discuss the most important public issues, um, and for example, to elect the king. And, uh, hmm? Okay, okay, I should come to the end, okay. So, um, um, and I find this uh, interpretation, Republican interpretation very interesting because it tells something about uh, people repeating certain um, 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 patterns, yes, thank you. Um, people are needing solidarity to act together. And uh, this interpretation had, had some uh, in, in scholars that were really interested in them, like Margaret Canovan, John Dreisek, uh, Leslie Holmes, Paul Blocker, who, who, who works in Prague. And uh, maybe I will just tell you more about it in the, in the further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elisabetta. Uh, um, Right, our final speaker, uh, Claudia Florentino Dobre. Well, uh, hello everyone. Thank you, Keith, for introducing me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, debate. And I have to say that uh, uh, I, I agree with my, uh, my colleagues, and uh, they pointed out there are um, different uh, uh, perspectives on the past. And I want to uh, stress that we should be very careful, especially uh, in our region, <laughs> in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, um, when we uh, use uh, um, and misuse uh, memory. Because um, uh, I can see that uh, as, a, as a historian, I've noticed that uh, recently memory became the favorite way to uh, represent the past and um, <clears throat> uh, in a way, it, uh, it took the, uh, the, the role of uh, which uh, history used to play, the, the writing of, uh, of history used to play in the 19th century uh, in building national identity, um, mythologies, and so on. And uh, we all know which were the consequences to world wars, uh, the Holocaust, uh, uh, some other genocides. So um, I think we should be very careful in promoting in the in what type of memory we are promoting in the public space, uh, that we should uh, be aware of uh, hegemonic memories, and uh, uh, which are uh, some uh, um, uh, group memories, collective memory, which is uh, um, promoted uh, in, the, in the public space. Um, because actually, uh, I, I think um, uh, societies have this <laughs> tendency to promote a certain version uh, in the public uh, space, so a certain uh, version of the past. And I think in a in democratic uh, society, um, we should open the space for discussion, uh, and we should debate about the, the past. Um, uh, various groups should be brought together and discuss um, uh, about uh, some traumatic events. And uh, I'm saying this because I want to uh, give you an example from Romania. And uh, as you may know, uh, during the Second World War, uh, Romania has a fascist uh, government, uh, which of course uh, took part in the Holocaust. Uh, there were around half a million of Jews and Roma people who were killed. Uh, and of course, all the others were persecuted uh, on the Romanian territory. And uh, um, so um, by, uh, by the, uh, the fascists. Of course, when the communists uh, uh, came to power uh, in March 1945 in, uh, in Romania, 
they uh, uh, started to um, um, persecute the fascists, not only because they were the fascists, but because the fascists, uh, especially those from the Iron Guard, were involved in the anti-communist resistance. So um, the, the communists uh, uh, arrested all these people, put them in prison, tortured, killed, etc. After the fall of uh, uh, communism in Romania in December 1989, um, of course, uh, we started to celebrate the anti-communist resistance. Yes, and uh, uh, at the very beginning, we also uh, celebrated all these fascists uh, who were involved in the anti-communist resistance. Uh, but of course, eventually, we have to recognize our role, I mean, the Romanian role in the Holocaust. And uh, started with uh, 2003, uh, we acknowledge the involvement of Romania in the Holocaust, and we banned from the public space any reference to the uh, fascists, to the symbols, characters, etc. Uh, but, uh, of course, this creates a frustration among these uh, people who claim uh, recognition, who claim uh, compensation from the state because they, were, uh, they consider themselves like uh, victims of the communist repression. So, uh, now we have uh, these two types of memories which are concurrential and even conflictual in the, in the public space. Who is uh, the real victim? And this is a discussion uh, we didn't uh, have actually in the society, and that's why I, I think we should uh, um, create uh, like a, a conciliation commission and to discuss about uh, this notion about this past um, in a debate to uh, encourage groups to, um, uh, I mean, memorial groups to, uh, to discuss this issue. And I think um, a democratic society should value human rights and also debates about the past and not to impose a narrative, a meta-narrative about the past, which is the right past or uh, uh, who is the, uh, the, uh, the group of people uh, that should be uh, celebrated. So my, uh, my idea of uh, solidarity is based on uh, uh, discussion, debates about the past, and not about uh, um, one imposed uh, meta-narrative, as it happened uh, 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 during communism, for instance, because we have only the official version of the past and all the other versions were forbidden. Uh, so I will elaborate more <laughs> if you, uh, uh, during the discussion and if you are uh, interested, but for now I'm going to uh, stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, all of your uh, presentations are extremely interesting and it, it gives me a problem now of where to start. Um, let me think. Let, let's, why don't we start with this idea that you brought up, in the, uh, Claudia, uh, of, of victimhood, you know, these conflicting ideas of victimhood. It seems to me that a lot of our memory, uh, our cultural memory, the things that we sort of promote uh, is the idea of victimhood, whether it's Second World War victimhood, Holocaust, uh, fascist Spain, and so on, victims of communism. Is victimhood, do you think, a, can it ever be a um, sound basis for any kind of solidarity? Let me put, I'll put that to you first, Claudia, and we can move on to the others. Uh, well, yes, if we think about um, um, people who suffered, Yes, uh, of course, this is a, to acknowledge the suffering. Yes, it's a form of uh, uh, solidarity. And, uh, but on the other hand, I do not think that uh, a nation should build uh, uh, their uh, um, representation of the past on victimhood. Unfortunately, in Romania, this is the case. And it's not only with communism, it's also before. We have this um, mythology of uh, victimhood. Uh, much as Poland, I think. Uh, but, uh, um, and also if we think about uh, the Holocaust or the Holodomor, yes. Um, recognizing victimhood, it's a, it's a form of solidarity. Uh, but uh, as I, I've already uh, stressed out, I, I don't think that uh, we should build uh, uh, our society, and especially uh, our contemporary societies, on this uh, uh, victimhood uh, paradigm. 
Um, w would you like to respond, Elzbieta? Uh, yes, I was thinking about solidarity and I was thinking about the structure of um, political and social demands that the solidarity movement was proposing. And um, it is really interesting because um, we had some other protests after the war in 1956, 68, 70, 76. And uh, when you look at the structure of these demands and uh, the content of these demands, they would say that they demanded some, something from the government, from the party. They wanted other people to do something for them to react to their suffering. And, and uh, when it came to the solidarity demands, uh, these demands were written in such a way that actually the people themselves um, were asking or demanding the government, the party, to let them do something, you know, not to create obstacles for them. And it is a completely different perspective. So actually the solidarity movement, probably in the, I don't know, <laughs> um, in our recent history, uh, trespassed this, um, I don't know, the victimhood. People were not understanding themselves as victims anymore. And um, it is very important to notice that, um, that they were speaking about uh, human suffering, not victimhood. They acknowledge that people were suffering, but, uh, but they would not consider themselves as victims because they, um, solidarity was a way of regaining agency, I think. So uh, it is really important, I think. Mm, yes, can I add something? It's just, now I'm talking in general uh, uh, in, the, in the society, but as you see, I uh, wrote a book here uh, about former political detainees and they uh, never claimed, at least people I, uh, I interviewed, they were victims, yeah? Uh, no, they do not uh, uh, take this, but uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm saying uh, and I'm talking about uh, this public uh, uh, image which is built in the society of victimhood, you know? It's not, uh, and I think it's not a good paradigm because there are a lot of other people who are not uh, uh, suffering at all and they should be included in, uh, uh, in our representation of the past, uh, which explain also why we have nostalgia in, uh, in Romania or Eastern Germany, yes? And this is, in part, it's a critic of the present, but also it's a fact that uh, a lot of people do not feel included in this public paradigm of victimhood, because I'm, I'm talking only about, <laughs> when you talk with, the, uh, with people who are depressed, they will not describe themselves as victims. Yeah, uh, mainly, I mean, women never as the heroes is also. Men, a little bit, yes. I have to say that when you talk with former political detainees who are men, they will present themselves, okay, I was a little bit like a hero, mm -hmm. but women never. Uh, they present it as a duty, uh, to our family, the nation, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I'm critical about, you know, the, the, the public uh, version, <laughs> uh, the public, uh, uh, you know, representation of this uh, past, which is really constructed around this victimhood uh, on, um, you know, the suffering and so on, which uh, uh, excluded all the other uh, type of, uh, uh, I don't know, version of the, of the past. And that's why I encourage the debate in, in, the, in the society. Yes, I, I agree with you, both of you, uh, but, but I, would, uh, I would add something as, uh, as, as I think always, uh, uh, as a sociologist, uh, I, said, uh, I think uh, social researchers have uh, a huge responsibilities responsibilities to deal with uh, different kind of uh, group of victims uh, uh, who are marginalized in the public sphere. So in in, in the Hungarian case, uh, uh, social scientists were the, the first who began to deal with the Holocaust topics. 
So uh, they collected many, many um, life histories uh, using qualitative methods, and and after that, uh, uh, social researcher were the, who dealt with the, the real points of uh, Hungarian Revolution. Uh, and, uh, and, and also uh, sociologists and historians began to deal with uh, um, religious persecution. So I think uh, we have a great responsibility to, to give them a voice uh, uh, in, from different uh, part of the society who uh, their stories is, is just uh, like uh, under, under the... Okay, I, I'll pass it to you in a second, uh, uh, Jesus, but f first I want to ask you uh, if you have these different, um, different groups of, of, of victims who all require some attention, do you not have the problem then of competitive victimhood? Uh, yes, of course, we have, <laughs> we have uh, some kind, different kind of uh, competition between a uh, remembrance group, uh, uh, but that is the postmodern society situation. I think we have to. We have to. It, it's a fact. Uh, uh, we have to deal, deal with this. Uh, we have to use. And, and what I think, uh, uh, we have to use uh, uh, communication. We have to use communicative memory, not always uh, cultural memory, because this is uh, another type, uh, another. Uh, uh, thing so uh, if we want to listen to each other we have to the first thing we have to tell our stories our narratives and uh, and describe what we are thinking about ourselves and and others this is the first step uh, and uh, I think uh, we this is led to the some kind of solution In the Spanish case, I think it was said by Carmen yesterday, since we still have a double or multiple vision about the common base of what the war represented, I think that nowadays in Spain, in many cases, there is a denial of victimhood from many victims from the Republican side. On the Francoist side, these victims occupy a central space during 40 years. And then these victims have gone into a second uh, place or have even disappeared from public space. In a parallel way, there is an emergence from the 80s, 90s. Uh, there is an emergence of the memory of the Republican victims. But nowadays, these Republican victims in this political and social context are denied or are even eliminated, even from public space. And we have seen the attack suffered by the monument, and this is just an example. There are many others. And in this case, there is a clear absence of uh, this necessary solidarity in the whole of society in order for these victims to be considered as such. And in many cases, this denial is visible, and we can see it in the suppression of uh, number of spaces, remains, and footprints of the Franco repression, for example. OK, uh, I'm going to say something that might be controversial here. <laughs> Uh, especially in the company that we're in, but um, what's, what's so bad about forgetting? I mean, it, it seems to me that uh, the first instinct of most people who've been through traumatic events is, is to forget. I mean, I, I, you, you don't know this, but my uh, mother-in-law is Hungarian and escaped from Hungary after the 1956 rev uh, revolution. Uh, when she came to England, she made a new life, had children. She didn't te even teach them Hungarian. My wife doesn't speak a word of Hungarian because she wanted to forget. Um, in the early 1990s, 1992, I went to Romania. Uh, and my 
to my surprise, uh, everybody in Romania seemed to have already forgotten the events of 1989. They, they wanted to move on completely. I went to a cafe to buy a coffee. I couldn't buy Romanian coffee. I had to get Nescafe. I, I wanted to buy a Romanian beer. I couldn't. They wanted to give me Heineken. Everybody wanted to move on and forget. So my question is, really, uh, why? Why remember? Why mnemonic solidarity? I, I'll go back to you, uh, uh, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, the people, the people from 1938, they're, they're not even alive anymore. Well, in the case of Spain, there is a very clear moment of uh, forgetting which are the years of Franco, and the Spanish society is looking towards the future. You can see it in the brief text which appear in the monument, Nevermore. This is way gone. Nevermore. And this is a phase which lasts in the 80s and 90s, more or less. But it is also true, and there is a given need, and this is what's been called uh, the grandson gaze, to learn what their grandparents went through, uh, something that was hidden by their parents or silenced by their parents or forgotten about their parents by their parents. I agree with you that at a given moment it will be convenient to go beyond that omnipresent phase of history and memory and maybe led way to history as Claudia was mentioning before. But the problem we are facing now is that there is a political important use of that memory. And while there is this political use is present, it will be very difficult to go into oblivion, whether it's possible to do it or not nowadays. Maybe it's necessary to implement memorial dynamics considering all the victims so we can look forward. Case, what you mentioned before about forgetting, this is a very common behavior. Uh, we can meet this kind of behavior everywhere. Uh, I, I met, I conducted uh, other research in the United States, and the situation was the same this kind of people who, who uh, went after the 1956 to United States. And they, first of all, first period of that life and later, they tried to forget everything and not to teach Hungarian language and, uh, and the culture at all. Uh, but the good news, the, the, the third, second, the third generation a little bit tried to turn back, but it's another story. Uh, but I want to, say uh, memory contains all kind all every, every time some kind of trauma and trauma we, we we don't in personal way and in the society as well we don't want to deal with it because it's a it's a very frustration it's very shame it happened something trauma with us with me it it's it's a it's very difficult to, to analyze personally. We need community. That's why we want to, want to uh, remember everything together. We want to share our story. So it's, it's, we need others. Uh, but first of all, uh, we have to find others who, who, tra who able to listen to us, to our story. So I think a trauma is not another important term if we want to, want to solve why we have to forget what happened with us. Yeah, um, uh, I just wanted to add, uh, and uh, Jesus uh, uh, pointed out, that um, uh, the problem is that this uh, past can be uh, instrumentalized, politically instrumentalized. And that's why we have to uh, discuss and debate and uh, not forget about. Uh, for instance, in Romania, there is now a new party which is called the Alliance for the Unity of Romanian, which is the acronym, it's 
Aur, which is gold in <laughs> the translation, and they do promote this, uh, uh, the, the memory of this uh, uh, former fascist group. And uh, that's why we don't, uh, uh, I mean, this uh, is part of their political agenda. And that's why we have to discuss about uh, this past in order not to let these people to tell uh, all kind of uh, things and also to promote uh, who knows what, because, uh, well, they are represented in the parliament, but they are not in, in power. So, but we don't know what might uh, happen if uh, they promote this type of discourse. That's why we cannot uh, leave this past behind because we have to be very careful uh, about it. And uh, let me tell you that uh, we are very uh, proud, uh, that we were very proud at that time, the, at the beginning of the 90s, to get rid of communists. So <laughs> we didn't want to, to remember anything. And anyhow, uh, unfortunately, a young generation uh, do promote oblivion. So <laughs> uh, this is also another uh, discussion. I, I, I think I agree with all of you, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, um, I wanted to ask you, Elżbieta, you, um, it seems to me that in Poland there hasn't been the opportunity to forget. It seems memory, one memory is piled on another. You know, so during the Second World War they were remembering uh, uh, um, escaping from the, the Russian imperialists. Uh, and then, you know, during the Solidarity Movement they were remembering the Armia Krajowa. And, and today, now we're, you know, there's still this sort of, this um, evil empire to your, to your east. Um, has there been any possibility to forget? And, um, well, how, how would you respond to what the others have said as well? I think that um, um, by, by forgetting, uh, I understand that you move moving forward, right? Yeah, forgetting, but also moving forward. Yeah, yes. creating a future. Creating Rather a future, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, it is, it is a very good question and a very difficult one. Um, um, I would say that um, I, I'm still thinking about this victimhood. And uh, I would say that um, Forgetting is, um, I'm not going to reply to your question directly, but a little bit indirectly, I would say. Uh, because forgetting is also about forgiving. And there, there are, you know, some very, I would say, from my perspective, very serious social and political division in Poland. So actually we need to talk about uh, historical issues, what happened to us as a society, um, as different groups within our society to understand each other, to reconcile, and to move forward. Actually, I think it is um, a necessary step to move forward. And I think, um, I would not say that our society, is, it is just my opinion maybe, it's not, uh, you know, I haven't done research on it. <laughs> Uh, but I wouldn't say that um, that our society lives is um, um, lives in the past. I wouldn't say so. I would say that um, uh, historic memory is really important to us. But um, I would say that people are just concerned with everyday issues. It is not like um, you know they wake up in the morning and they think what happened in the 1980s, you know, <laughs> we, are, we are taking care of our daily duties. Um, can can mm -hmm. I just, uh, I have a note from the translator, w when we turn away from the microphones, they can't hear, so um, keep pointing your mouth at the microphone. So. Um, right, okay. Um, I want to turn now to some, polit some of the political uses of memory. Um, it, it seems to me that quite often, when we talk about memory, when we're remembering the past, actually what we're doing is thinking about the present. So, for example, in my own country, you know, we, uh, in 2016, we were talking all about World War II and how Britain stood alone 
and it was, of course, actually all about Brexit. It was nothing to do with World War II at all. Um, I'm assuming that this is the same in every country, and, and this is, the instrumentation of the past in order to create political solidarity for your narrow political aims is a problem that, that we are seeing all over the world, I think. Perhaps you'd like to elaborate on some of this. I, who shall I begin with? I'll begin with uh, uh, you, Claudia. Uh, yes, but this is the definition of the memory, you know. Uh, it's a reconstruction of the past from the perspective of the present. Mm. <laughs> Therefore, uh, uh, it's always about the, about the present. Um, and, uh, well, um, <clears throat> what we can do... Yeah. But if that's the case, if that is the case, should we be promoting memory or should we be s sort of uh, trying to keep it in check? Uh, well, I, I did my, I pledge for uh, keep, it, <laughs> keep it in check, you know. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this was all about, I, I was saying. Uh, and that's why I, uh, I emphasize that we have to uh, really debate about the past, uh, uh, not to uh, uh, give uh, uh, room to this hegemonic memory, I mean to some group uh, uh, which would promote uh, its own uh, collective memory and uh, to promote one paradigm about uh, interpreting the past, you know. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, for me, this is the, the, the main perspective we should, uh, uh, we should adopt. Uh, Jesus, um, you could say the same thing, uh, like I said about Brexit, you could apply that to Catalonia. The, the, uh, rem the memory of Francoist Spain is perhaps a sort of a political way of uh, encouraging the idea of independence. Um, I'm aware this is a, this is a, a, a sensitive subject. It is indeed a sensitive topic. Nonetheless, it is absolutely right that what you mentioned is, I mean, it, of course, nationalists instrumentalize history as well as Spanish nationalism. The Catalan and the Basque nationalist movements somehow appropriate this anti-Franco past, which in some cases is absolutely true, but in others, not so much. And the same happens on the other side, right, from the Spanish nationalism movements. The problem is that oftentimes the axis is perhaps broad, too broad. And today we live in the here and now dictatorship, right? So the past becomes present and the future becomes present. We are somehow trapped by present in our times. So in this context, as Carmen mentioned yesterday, there are strange phenomena, some eccentric memory recoveries happen. Let me give you an example about Spain. In Madrid, the city council recently inaugurated a monument in Madrid, in the city of Madrid, to remember the legion, the Spanish legion, who played an important role during the war and before the war. Nonetheless, in the Almudena Cemetery, a monument, a tiny monument paying tribute to more than 3,000 victims victim, sorry, of the civil war, was dismantled, was destroyed, removed from the city, by the city council. One of the lave motive of the extreme right-wing movement in Spain is precisely the withdrawal of any tribute to Republicans. There is a direct attack against memory laws by extreme right-wing movements. So indeed, there is a clear instrumentation because we're speaking about a civil war, right, in the case of Spain. And let me put it in a bold manner. There are certain identifications with the war, let's say, uh, with the civil war still, yeah?
Okay, in that case, I will move on to the next um, idea, which is about monuments. Um, now, a couple of years ago, monuments were in the, the, the headlines everywhere uh, because people were tearing them down, uh, particularly the, 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 the Black Lives Matter movement, and um, you know, people tearing down uh, monuments to do with slavery and colonialism and so on. Um, and, and you just mentioned, Jesus, uh, about the, the, the removal of monuments. Um, this, is, this is not a new thing. Uh, it happens everywhere. Um, do you think that it's inevitable that as our memory changes, we have to remove these monuments and replace them? Or, or is there, are there good ways of incorporating difficult memories into our present, more comfortable memory structure? Who shall I, who shall I pick on? <laughs> um, I, I'll ask you, actually, Shijana, because uh, I know that there are some interesting monuments in Budapest, which I'm thinking of the monument to the victims of the German occupation, um, where they try and incorporate uh, there's a monument and an anti-monument which try to incorporate different levels of memory. So it's, uh, I think uh, we have a big debate always around uh, monuments because I think the, the debates because of the different uh, remembrance communities in Hungary. We have many, many uh, remembrance community and, and they want to keep their own values and own identity. And it's quite frustration thing always. Uh, I, however, I think uh, <laughs> We need to discuss and we need to express our frustration, not, not just be silent. We have to say, we have to listen. So I, I don't know what is the solution. I think uh, we, and I, I say again, we are social researchers and we have to say what we think, what we realize, what we listen to other people in the ordinary people and just uh, just share their stories share their feelings and not to be silent so it's i don't know really the answer but i have i, I support every kind of uh, uh, debates about monuments well, I think, uh, because we were talking about Hungary, I think the Memento Park, it's a good solution for these uh, monuments. Yes, to, especially uh, for the, actually I, I'm anti-communist, I have to say, <laughs> that uh, even if it doesn't look like maybe, but I'm uh, anti-communist, and uh, uh, but as a scholar, of course, I have to uh, think about all the other uh, perspective. Um, but I, I think the Memento Park in Budapest, uh, it's a good solution, especially for the, the, the communist monuments, yes? Because you have uh, there, you can have an explanation, and also uh, you will remove them from the public space and, uh, uh, you know, uh, in order not to, um, um, how to say, um, actually to, you have to, in a way, it's good to, to remove them from the public space because you don't want to uh, uh, see them uh, uh, every day when you go to work or whatever. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, I don't think we have to hide all these monuments because uh, you cannot really uh, hide uh, what happened. And it's better to have it there to discuss about this. There is uh, something similar in Sofia about uh, the communist monuments, and I think it's a good approach for this type of, uh, of monuments to have it in uh, some kind of museum to explain so young generation could see uh, all this. And also sometimes there are uh, like, uh, you know, um, um, sculpture which are uh, works of art and it's good to uh, not to destroy them actually. I, I mean, this is <laughs> one point of view about. 
Elspeth? Um, I'm aware that uh, lots of communist monuments and monuments to brotherhood in arms and so on in, in, in Poland have been removed in the last 10 years. Yes, 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 they were. Some of them were uh, moved to memory parks like, like that. Some of, uh, some of them I w were just, you know, hidden. <laughs> But I think it is uh, creating these memory parks is a, is a good idea because uh, it creates um, it creates room for discussion, debate, understanding. Because if we do not uh, work through um, these difficult experiences, they may be repeated. Just and for some people, these are. Um, Probably not many people in Poland, but uh, for some, these, these monuments are meaningful in a, in a way. So I think it, uh, uh, I would side with, with what uh, my, my colleague just said. Is there not the problem, though, that uh, if you put them in a museum mm -hmm. or a monument park, yeah, the only people who see them are the people who already understand these. They, they're going there. They're, they're self-selecting. They're the ones who you don't need to reach with the memory. Um, and, and you also have a danger, don't you, of making a kind of communism theme park, uh, you know, Disneyland for communist monuments. <laughs> what do you think? Well, the other option is, um, <laughs> is, is to keep the, the monument and present a kind of trigger warning, like, in front of it, you know, with... Uh, um, um, a board explaining what is the monument, when was it established, uh, what is it representing, the history of the monument. It, it could also be a, an idea to keep them in, you know, in a public space and uh, explain the history of, the, of this monument. Maybe it would not be, you know, this. Um, uh, maybe in this way we could avoid this process of selection of the viewers. Yes. Um, but I think there is a difference of, um, you know, with, with communist monuments, there is a problem of of, a, of an imposition, you know, because they, uh, it, I think it is a difference um, when we want to commemorate something by ourselves and when these monuments are somehow imposed on us. Yes, and it is it is also a, it's a, and also a problem. And I think it is also a way of dealing with a trauma <laughs> when you create a kind of Disneyland of monuments because these monuments become less you know, dangerous, less traumatic when you try to um, um, a little bit distance yourself from them. Okay? Uh, just a <laughs> short note. When um, this is our case, when we first of all visited communist monument park in Budapest. Uh, my husband and me, we were very disappointed. Oh, why, why should have to stay there? Why? But we invited our children to visit them and we, can, we could explain many, many stories and many, many uh, uh, feelings and about communism. So it, they, they could learn a lot when they not touch, but what they realize the, how the monuments were very strong, very huge, and untouchable, and uh, everything. The, I mean, next generation, it's, it's, uh, it's many times, I think, it's good to realize what had happened in the past. So that's why it's uh, not, not the shame to to keep them. It's, uh, it's good for us, at least, because of the other generation, because of the future, probably not to do the same thing again. I have to, to agree with Professor Bogre. I think it's an opportunity, especially for the young generation. And in the case of Romania, uh, I'm thinking especially about uh, Ion Antonescu, who was the leader of the country during the Second World War. 
It's important for the young generation to go to museum and to learn about uh, uh, Ion Antonescu that he was a war criminal, he was uh, uh, involved in the Holocaust. Otherwise, if you look on the internet, you'll find only good things about him and uh, mostly that he was a victim of uh, communism and uh, you will see uh, being celebrated and I think it would be an opportunity to go to a museum and to learn some other aspects about uh, his political activity. Um, and also, I think uh, the, the communist monuments, it's an opportunity to discuss uh, for the young generation about uh, all these people, what uh, they have done. Uh, of course, uh, in Romania, we don't have <laughs> these uh, um, uh, monuments anymore. I mean, they are uh, hidden away and destroyed and so on. And also because in, uh, uh, in the last years of communism, we mostly built uh, national, uh, I mean, monuments dedicated to national heroes, not to communist figures. So uh, <laughs> this is, that's why we don't have a communist uh, park. Do you want to add anything, uh, Jesus? And, and then we'll go to questions. Okay. In the Spanish case, the destruction of monuments is nothing new, as you already mentioned. By the way, the monument removal and vandalization process started back during the Franco dictatorship in 1979 when the first municipal elections were celebrated. Some city councils, like San Sebastian City Council, decided to remove all Franco monuments from public spaces, but 40 years after, many cities preserve them and keep them in the public Spain, in the public space, sorry, even if the, according to the historic memory bill, they shall be removed because monuments, these monuments are not, let's say, attached to democratic values. They do not represent democratic values. So there are, there are resistances here in Catalonia. There are quite remarkable examples, like in the case of Tortosa in the south of Catalonia. Perhaps in Spain we've fallen into a trap. We haven't been able to put forward interesting memorial practices like anti-monuments that have been extremely fruitful in other parts of the world, like in Germany. We've had German proposals, but we have not implemented them. So there is this whole idea of physical imposition into the public space when it comes to monuments, right? Monuments are understood as physical impositions instead of opportunities. Hmm, it is a pity. I believe that in the case of Spain, this has not been properly uh, observed. Now, when it comes to the disappearance of monuments or the removal of monuments, well, the dynamics has been rather complicated here in Spain. In the case of the Franco equestrian monuments, well, many of them have been preserved in military quarters, at the beginning at least. So monuments have been somehow transferred, the memory has been transferred into a quite dangerous environment, military headquarters. Other monuments have been preserved, like a monument to Enesimo Redondo, giant sculptors that have been preserved. But then I asked the director of the Salamanca Museum where the monument was, and he said that it was in a deposit in Madrid. So monuments are removed from the public space, but there, but then there is no like a pedagogic dimension. They are not used for pedagogic purposes, as far as I know. Okay, uh, let's turn to some questions. We've got sort of uh, let me see, ten or fifteen. Fifteen minutes would be pushing it, but uh, yeah. Pardon. All right, uh, Piotr Naimski from Poland. Uh, I would like to ask you, or the panel, do you see any space for proud as the background for remembrance and memory? Because victimology is, of course, uh, the major part of our discussion 
and this major part of memory. But is it the only part? Um, just a short answer. Uh, as I realized uh, at the begin after 1989, uh, we began to remember uh, in the past what had happened after uh, Second World War and uh, during uh, communism and Qadar era. Uh, that was the first step to 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 research and to talk about uh, victims. We were, we were very proud uh, what, they, uh, what they did. But uh, if, if we try to, try to understand and, uh, and we talk about a lot, but I think it's necessary to move to, step, to, to move to the future and we, we just uh, uh, see more details. Of our victims, this is for sure. But I think that we could be proud of our victories as well. Okay, uh, I would like to respond a little bit to that. Um, I, my understanding of the way the Second World War, for example, has worked is that in the immediate aftermath of the war, everybody wanted to be a hero. You know, heroes were the thing. You know, the, 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 the Jewish monuments that were produced then were not about victimhood. They were the heroes of the, the Jewish ghetto in, in Warsaw, that, that kind of thing. Over time... Heroes become problematic because, you know, heroes are not... Uh, uh, we like to think of them as perfect. You know, they are angels, they, are, they, they can do no wrong. But as soon as you look at them in any detail, you see that they're not, they're not perfect. The same with... The same with uh, but with victims, it's much more difficult to challenge their imperfections. With heroes, you can, you can challenge them. So, as a consequence, over time our idea of heroism has mutated into one more, much more of victimhood, so that now even the, the sort of the allies, the, the, the British and the Americans are... Sorry? Heroism is... I don't, I don't follow you. Anyhow, it's time to, to move to the next question. Uh, uh, here at the back. To the question, I would like to come back to the question of memory. I think memory uh, is a question of identity of human being. Every society and everyone uh, is remembering. But the question is what is the basis uh, and what is the value based for the memory? Uh, is it the nation? Is it the glory of my own nation? And the victims of my own nation are important and the victims of the other not? Uh, or what is for us? It, is it just to be against communism? I know a lot of uh, enemies of communism which are not the basis of democracy. If you see, uh, for instance, in Germany, there were, after 45, a lot of old Nazis belonging in the West administration because they were in the Cold War anti-communists, because there was a continuity from Nazi and to be the West against Moscow. Uh, if you see, for instance, the, some um, fighter uh, in Lithuania, um, in the so-called Wood Brothers, a lot of them cooperated with Germans in murdering youth. After 45, they continued fighting against Moscow. We should know it. They were against communism. Are they the heroes we have to honor? Uh, I think the question is the basis for our memory. Uh, I think 
the question of rule of law is such a value. The dignity of the single human being is that kind of basis. And that means, even for migrants today, is it just the Ukrainians uh, because they are in the war by Russia? Or do we accept that the Syrians, the Russian bombs in Syria, in Aleppo, um, murdered a lot of people there too? Do we accept the Syrians in the same way as the Ukrainians? I think these are questions we have to deal with. Okay, so uh, we have the individual memory, national memory, transnational memory. Uh, what's the basis for our solidarity? What, what are we talking about here? Um, I'll go to well, Claudia. I just uh, said that I think human rights should be the, uh, the main discourse to build. Uh, I don't know, especially in the Romanian case, because we don't have a, a past uh, to be proud of. I mean, we don't have so, so much in, in the past. We don't have uh, so many heroes. <laughs> and I think, uh, uh, but anyhow, as a, as a scholar, I do think that uh, human rights should be the, the uh, right approach to build uh, identities, uh, national identities today, and not necessarily as some past. Mm. Uh, Bien, eh, yo creo, volviendo un poco a la situación... Now, going back to the Spanish context, I believe in the Spanish context, in today's world, I, I mean, in today's society, it's very difficult to identify heroes from the past, right? On the grounds of today's values. Of course, there are some, but analyzed from the prisma of the present, it's very difficult to keep considering them as heroes, right? Or at least it's very difficult for heroes from the past to represent everybody today, because of course the struggles from the past were very different from the present. Again, as it has been said before, there has been an important change of paradigm, right? Heroes have become victims in many occasions, not only when it comes to memory, right? Socially speaking, today we are immersed in a, let's say, the, the victim is at the center, not so much heroes, probably. I don't know if I'm answering to the question. Um, hello, my name is Olga, I'm from Ukraine, and I'm director of uh, Memorial Museum Totalitarian uh, Regime, and we have a collection of Soviet monuments. And um, uh, in, pr in practice, when you moved monument from public space to museum, uh, you must remember that, that is, this is a big uh, public discussion and fighting and scandal and so on and in we we have this process and uh, when you uh, want to save some monument and move to museum it's a big scandal but it's very important uh, because from my museum case this monument uh, very important to uh, explain what the communist regime was and when muse when a monument come to museum uh, mon uh, um, this monument has new life, and this monument can explain all story. Uh, monument move from uh, monument to grown, uh, uh, and uh, can talk, and it's very important because for young generation like me, I was born in 1993. It's a history for my uh, grandmother and father. It's uh, sometimes personal trauma, but if we want to have this dialogue with the generation, I think we need this monument also in museum. Um, Mm, and mm, now, when visitors come, uh, he starts to rethink in this monument, and this monument looks like maybe Marvel heroes for young generation. And uh, also, uh, it's very interesting to uh, talk with this monument and uh, people. Uh, but it's you. You said that monument Disneyland, Disneyland, Disneyland. 
Disneyland. <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's very uh, important to have this balance, not fun and use this monument for history and talking. Uh, yes, and, but I think in Ukraine we have this case only in Lviv because in, in general uh, monument disappearance and nobody know where monument now. Uh, uh, and in Lviv we have this process with the municipality, museum workers, uh, Soviet society, activists, historical, uh, and also it's why we save this monument. Um, say, please save monument in your city and start to talk. So uh, uh, we're going to be, we, we have to stop now. Just one more question, one more question. Okay. Uh, it's not more a question, it's a remark. Make it, make it quick, though, because yes. I, I want to uh, get um, We speak about monuments. I think we forget one monument we've not spoken about, is that was the names of the streets. It's a very interesting issue. In Amsterdam, from Holland, Johan Grunbauer, um, we had three, we, after the World War, we had three streets. It was the street of Roosevelt Avenue, the um, Church Avenue, and the Stalin Avenue. And in '56. They were so upset of this Russian invasion, so the Stalin Avenue was renamed to the Free Freedoms Avenue, and we all met at the Victorian Square. It's very interesting. The second uh, aspect is the name to the street to the victims. They, they became heroes, like Mel Nelson Mandela. There are a lot of them in, in the whole Europe. But uh, the hero was the white-skinned, Václav Havel, also a prisoner, became like Mandela president, okay. no streets are renamed. And the most absurd thing, I met in Haarlem, the capital of North Holland. There's a street, it's part of name of Jan Palach, and comes over to the Rudolf Slamsky Street. Two victims of communism. Can you understand this? Rudolf Slamsky, he was, the, the, he um, exposed this Communism in, in Czechoslovakia later on became a victim, and he met, compared as the same as Rudolf Slansky. So beware renaming streets to heroes or victims. Right. Okay. Right. Raphael, last question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Last question and commentary is because I wanted to go back to this, uh, in my opinion, not contradictory um, notions like proudness and victimhood. And exactly your uh, example of, um, of proud, of victorious, uh, so the uh, monument for um, fighters, ghetto fighters in Warsaw, has two parts. It is the wall, and from the one side you have the fighters and from the other side, we have a procession of women and children who were victims of that, uh, of, 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 of ghetto, not, not only, uh, so in this particular case of the ghetto uprising. So there is a place for both. And our life, our history, and our memory is complex enough to have a place for both. I think it is a crucial for this kind of discussion. And you show, you all show that uh, our societies are deeply divided between different kinds of narratives. But uh, there are not only two narratives. This is much more complex. Thank you. OK, um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll wrap it up now. Um, thank you very much, my panel here. You've done a great job. And uh, thank you all for your questions. Um, that's it. We're done.